Hello, you're watching Video Game Subscription Wars, I'm Sam, and I'm here to give you a taste of the best RPGs on PlayStation Now. Have you heard about the channel? Here I cover and compare video game subscriptions and all the games they have to offer to see which is the best for you. If this video touches you, or maybe you smell something funny, please let me know in the comments below, and if all that makes sense, let's get on with the video. It's the second part in this series on the best PS Now games and I've got my work cut out for me today. There are dozens of RPGs on PlayStation Now and each game takes dozens of hours to complete. To narrow things down, I've made my RPG criteria to be any game in which you gather experience to level up your character, earning new items and abilities, skills, that kind of thing. I think that's what a game needs at a minimum to be classed as an RPG, but I'll admit that it's a very broad genre that has lots of variables. That means for this video, these games didn't make the cut. Even though you're probably not wrong in calling them an RPG, you don't level up your character, so they're out. Don't worry, we'll get to them, just not today. And the same goes for JRPGs. There are, again, so many on PlayStation now, and I was trying to cram so much playtime into each day that the thought of turn-based combat was just... Uh, it was too much for me. That brings me to my last point before we get started. I'm about to cover 13 games, and the average time it takes to play just one is almost 18 hours. Full disclosure, I haven't, one, one second, I just worked this out and I've already forgotten. Um, I haven't spent 234 hours playing these games this week. But my time spent playing was so condensed that the kind of niggles that you might find stretched over a normal playtime of 12 hours, you know, when you have breaks for sleeping and eating and socializing, um, I found in half the time. So I'm hungry, I'm tired, and I'm alone, but I managed to bring you this video this week. So it was all worth it, really. Uh, even with that being said, here's a list of all the RPGs that didn't make this video, so expect a part two, or a part three maybe, sometime in the future. But for now, let's get to it with the best PS Now Games RPG edition. An RPG should create a convincing representation of a character and let you embody it. It's in the name, after all. R.P.G. What better roles to play than Spider-Man and Batman? Spider-Man certainly captures that feeling of being the friendly, fast-talking hero of New York City. NYC is as bustling and as beautiful as ever, and swinging through its streets feels hugely energizing. It takes some practice before you can do it with style, but a little persistence and you'll get the hang of it. Spider-Man's excellent and varied movement lets you zip through your superhero to-do list, beating up bad guys, helping citizens, photographing landmarks and collecting backpacks. Wait, so these are all your backpacks? You have 55 backpacks? Boss battles serve up some variety between the groups of street thugs, but to be honest, Spider-Man doesn't have the most memorable set of villains, barring Dr. Octagonopus. You lock up the Kingpin at the start of the game, and after that you better watch out for Rhino, I guess? Oh, oh look out, Vulture is here. The Arkham series is really all about the villains. Batman is a badass, no arguments there, but he's also kind of boring. The excitement and a lot of the style of the Arkham series comes from the Joker. One of the most well-crafted villains of all time has one of the best antagonal character arcs in a video game. The locales of Arkham Asylum and Arkham City get their life from the notorious villains that inhabit them some of which you don't ever see, but find the imprints they've left. Even the Riddler, who makes a regular collectathon enjoyable in the first game, stretches it to its limits in the second before making you drive a tank. Actually, that's a common theme in Arkham Knight and I kinda hate it, but they conclude the Joker arc nicely, is what I'm trying to say. Apart from the Joker tank. Gameplay-wise, Spider-Man and Batman are very similar. Both boil down to traversing the city's skylines, stopping every now and again to beat up groups of goons on the ground or pick them off from the rooftops. I'm not recommending one over the other, this isn't a Marvel vs DC debate, but you really should have played the Arkham games by now, and Spider-Man is only on PS Now for three months, so there is that. It took me at least five hours to make my mind up on Bloodborne. 
where I fluctuated between admiring and despising its very concept. In the end, the best thing I can come up with is that it's the most addictive game on this list. You have no idea how many times I've walked through the same areas of Yan. I have no idea how many times I've done it, trying every conceivable route and playstyle, but each time met with the inevitable sight of death. All my blood echoes, lost, and all that time wasted. But Bloodborne takes a different form in the moments you're away from the game. In the safety of my imagination, I can beat Bloodborne. I can replay levels and see how I could do things differently, how I could upgrade my weapon and change my gear. And it's the conceptual gameplay of Bloodborne, and any From Software title, that leaves you wanting more. And when you do actually succeed, there's no greater sense of achievement quite like it. It quickly fades though, and you're immediately on to the next round. And unfortunately, I can't commit to the 100 hours it would probably take for me to beat this game. I'll get to it, but we must move on. At the other end of the spectrum, you have the most over-the-top combat in a video game. The entirety of the Devil May Cry series goes balls to the wall ridiculousness while somehow managing to avoid being obnoxious. If you're new to the series like I was, I'd suggest Devil May Cry 3 as it's a prequel story and arguably the best game in the franchise, so I guess I'd recommend it if you're familiar with the series as well. Hopefully Devil May Cry 5 makes it to PS Now sometime in the future. And speaking of ridiculousness... There are some games for which a formulated review doesn't do the game justice. Some games you just have to see it to believe it. Honestly, um, don't actually play this because the game is terrible, and it doesn't even match my criteria for an RPG. To be honest, I just put it in here for the joke. Because of the, um, the dildo bat. You, you get it? It's funny, right, guys? Destroy All Humans isn't the same manic creation sandbox like Saints Row 4, but it's still fantastically stupid. A satirical take on old alien invasion films. I have fond memories of playing this on the PS2, terrorising humans with telekinesis, mind control and anal probes. Yes, I'm sure fond memories of anal probes is going to be the statement you take away from this bit. It's the nature of modern day adventure games to include vast open worlds filled with trivial things to do and errands to run that provide you with just enough XP to make them worth your time. Both these titles offer that and both have Shadow in the title. Shadow of Mordor borrows 95% of its combat from the Arkham games, using rhythm based strikes and counters to build a combo meter that triggers special moves, or silently picking off foes one by one. The same way Batman stacks his utility belt with a dubious number of gadgets, the part ranger part wraith Talion learns several powers over the course of the game, which in fairness have more game altering potential than a few extra batarangs. Shadow of Mordor's defining feature though is the Nemesis system, which is basically a procedural orc generator built to shake up the usual groups of anonymous thugs. It doesn't avoid it completely, but it adds some personality to your cannon fodder and gets more complex in the late game once you learn to bend the will of orc captains and turn them against each other. I find it really hard to judge Shadow of the Tomb Raider on its own merit. The final chapter in the latest Lara Croft reboot, I can't help but compare it to the first two games. After 2013's Tomb Raider reshaped the Lara Croft mold into something new and gritty, 2015's Rise of the Tomb Raider upped the stakes in excellent fashion, developing Lara into a three-dimensional character and providing the biggest and best puzzle-based tombs in any Tomb Raider game. Shadow of the Tomb Raider upped the ante yet again, but the only thing to show for it is Lara's kill count. You go on an absolute tear, making Uncharted's Nathan Drake, of which Shadow has taken clear inspiration from, seem like a pacifist in comparison. The consequence of your bloody actions is the focal point for the story, to be fair, and it almost goes somewhere. Like they toyed with the idea of turning Lara into the villain, but couldn't go through with it. And the reboot ends with Lara Croft just as much the thrill-seeking adventurer as in previous works, but it kind of feels like that thrill is for blood rather than treasure. Vampire makes you choose between your duties as a doctor and your urges as a vampire in early 20th century London. If you can set aside your morals, suckling on humans gives you the XP needed to level up and unlock a host of neat upgrades. 
but taking innocent lives through your vampiric embrace will decrease a district's health status and potentially plunge it into chaos. You can earn more XP by learning more about an individual before you embrace them, which is where Vampire's moral balancing act shines through. If you learn more about an individual, you can kill less people, but it feels like far more of a betrayal sucking the blood from a mother you know has children to look after. As a vampire, you must satisfy your thirst for blood. But my thirst was for XP. You'll want to unlock as many abilities as possible as the core combat doesn't take long to get quite dull and repetitive. A more stealth based approach could have benefited vampire I think, only engaging in combat when there's no other choice. There are stealth based abilities to unlock but fights are very hard to avoid. Also god save me from this stupid navigation system. Why have you given me a cursor when I'm on console? I feel kind of bad ending on this note but seriously, did you really feel the need to make navigating menus 10 times more difficult? Like whose idea was this? Seriously, whose idea was this? Who are you? If you want to skulk through the shadows, inevitably getting caught and choosing to either restart or turn into a homicidal maniac, play some Dishonored. Here there isn't really any moral compass to deter you from killing everyone in your path, no obvious good or bad decisions. The impact of your choices happens more on the surface level, sneaking past guards by skipping across rooftops, maybe finding a secret passageway, or possessing a rat or, you know, kill everyone who stands in the way if you want to. A tight mix of unlockable powers add more flavours to each level and how you approach it, and combine to make Dishonored an excellent stealth game. For the most part, at least. Some AI are still hopelessly oblivious while others have the vision of a hawk on Adderall. It's also a shame that PS Now doesn't have Dishonored 2, which improved on the first in practically every way, and it's these things that stop it being the best stealth based RPG on PS Now because that title goes to... Of course, it's Metal Gear Solid. You don't technically upgrade Snake through experience points in these games. I mean, how can you improve on this? But I'm including the Phantom Pain here because of the game's flexibility. New ways to play the game unlock as you progress, many of which aren't exactly stealthy and Neither is the game's hour long prologue, just the events that transpire here are just <laughs> mental. But it's still Metal Gear, so espionage is the intent. But it's not your only option. Far from it. You can plan out your equipment before dropping into a mission, selecting the right camouflage and non-lethal weapons to sneak in and out, using cover to remain undetected. Or you can pick everyone off from a distance using precision weapons. Or you can call in for backup and let them do the heavy lifting for you. You can do things the old fashioned way. Or the slightly less old fashioned way. Or, after 20 attempts to get the perfect no detection run, just say f*** it and do the best that you can. And if that's still not enough, try infiltration at night. And if that's still not enough, you can wear the chicken hat. Everyone will know of your cowardice, however. They might not be able to see you, but they know. We all know. All of this possibility is underpinned by fundamentally good stealth mechanics. That hinges on the responsiveness of the AI, and in my opinion, the Phantom Pain sets the bar. It's entirely possible to play this like a traditional Metal Gear Solid game. The variety of items are just there to suit different playstyles. That might not sound like a huge selling point. A lot of games, or rather their marketing departments, tout that it's different every time you play. But for the Phantom Pain, it really feels true. The fluidity in which you can change things up, from an out of sight supply drop, to a quick evacuation, to just gathering loads of unnecessary explosives, is what gives the Phantom Pain true variety. 
and it's in the foundations as a Metal Gear Solid game that give it lashings of replayability. Because this is the type of repetition that I love. Because this is the type of repetition that I love. Because this is the type of repetition that I love. Both Bloodborne and The Phantom Pain punish you for slight errors, and in doing so compel you to try again. But where Bloodborne forced me into endless repeats of the same levels, here I'm choosing to press the restart button. I can overpower the enemy through force and several bullets, but I'll have to deal with the disappointment of this end screen. So I choose to play it again because I want the no kills and the perfect stealth bonuses. I want to be big boss. So the Phantom Pain gets my super sneaky star of approval. So that caps off a whole lot of playtime for me this week. Now they say playing video games is easy. Well, you come back and say that again once you try to do a speedrun of Shadow of the Tomb Raider, Sally. Yeah, then you'll think twice. <laughs> but I hope it was worth it. And if you liked this video, then it was. If you did, um, please leave a like below and drop a comment down there so I know to keep making these types of videos. Um, there are loads of genres on PlayStation Now and I'm really enjoying doing this stuff. So if you like it, let me know and I'll keep making it. Simple as that. But thanks for watching. Um, subscribe for more if you haven't already. There's loads more on the way and I'll see you down in the comments um, to chat. Here I go.